just want to just uh, welcome you all to our uh, Thursday Sociology Seminar Series. Um, and we have um, a double presentation today. Um, the focus of the presentation is on um, agent-based modelling as a technique for the social sciences, but particularly trying to understand how that approach may help us to look into social innovation, the emergence of social innovation processes. So the two presenters today are Dr. Jorgi Bobyshev, who is a senior statistician from RTI International in the US, and I'm sure Jorgi might like to say something more about that at his presentation, the end of the presentation perhaps, tell you more about the RTI. And I'm delighted also to welcome one of our own PhDs, um, Han Young, who is going to present um, his, uh, one of his papers from his uh, PhD research. Um, and that research is being conducted in, in China, and he has some lovely empirical data. Um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about that work and some of the findings using a uh, simulation approach, using an agent-based modeling approach to, uh, to model the data. So um, we'll begin with Jorgi's presentation. It'll probably be about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe a little bit more. Um, then there'll be some opportunity for questions and answers, and then we'll go on to uh, give um, space for Heinz presentation. I know that some of you are staying for the first paper because we run back to back with statistics, so their seminar series kicks off. So some of the folk are going to go to that seminar series, and I think there's actually others who are coming in for your presentation. So there might be a little bit of shuffling around. So. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me, first of all. And I uh, really like uh, coming over here and the short course. So, uh, first of all, I will say a few words about RTI International. Uh, we are located in um, our headquarters is in uh, Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. We are uh, an independent, uh, non profit uh, research institute. Uh, we're also um, a, private, um, a private research institute. Our focus is, um, focus and mission is improving human conditions by uh, turning knowledge into practice. So we essentially work on quite a variety of projects. Uh, most of them, or actually all of them are uh, related to um, improving human well-being. And so, few very large areas uh, of research that we are uh, famous for are uh, surveys, uh, health research, and statistics. And recently, uh, as you know, uh, uh, there have been a big push towards uh, big data and data analytics, so we also formed the Center for uh, Data Science. Um, and so like, uh, uh, out of about 260 statisticians that we have uh, at RTI, we have like a, a smaller center which is now uh, 16 people uh, who are uh, data scientists and so on also uh, part of that center. I just wanted to uh, briefly mention that um, the main difference and the main flavor of data science that is related to uh, traditional statistics is that uh, data science data might not necessarily be as clean so there could be multiple uh, sources like Twitter, Facebook, um, and other uh, text data. And so uh, we are moving into uh, this area, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, also, as you can see, uh, we have offices uh, all over the world. That's why you know, we're called RTI International. RTI stands for Research Triangle Institute. Close the curtain. <laughs> And uh, we also have partnership um, uh, with UCD. We have a um, uh, uh, center for uh, advanced methodology, which is uh, uh, placed in uh, UE Institute. All right, so I think that's, that's it for a, a quick introduction. Now I'll talk a little bit about uh, various methods and tools that, that are used and uh, the reason why I wanted to um, there is in social science and research and the reason why I wanted to uh, talk about that is to actually uh, position agent-based models 
in the whole universe of, of various methods. So first of all, I'm just wondering uh, uh, who is familiar with agent-based models? Few folks should, who took the class at least, you know, right? <laughs> so, um, I wanted to, uh, to refer to um, a very nice uh, website, it's uh, uh, the company called a a XJ Tech, and they have um, uh, published a, a nice book that summarizes various methods and techniques. Um, and running simulation models, uh, it's a great overview, so um, here I'll uh, provide a brief summary uh, so that uh, you know, you, you'll have an idea, you'll get an idea of why uh, you should use or why you should not use agent-based models. So agent-based modeling, uh, agent-based model is just another uh, technique, another uh, another tool in the toolbox. And some people uh, consider it the ultimate um, uh, tool for uh, s s simulating social processes. Other people are saying that it's completely useless uh, uh, tool and it's just like only good for uh, theoretical models. So I will discuss some advantages and disadvantages. Right, but I just wanted you to uh, take a look at this diagram, and this is a hierarchy of um, uh, of models uh, that, that people can use. And again, I, I wanted to mention that there is uh, not much of, uh, of consistency in terminology because. Um, people have been uh, building models in computer science, in biology, in social sciences, in statistics, in mathematics, in, uh, in ecology, so everybody was bringing their own terminology. And so if you start reading uh, papers, you can uh, run into uh, uh, a number of very interesting terms like uh, individual-based model, um, micro-simulations and whatnot. Uh, so here I just wanted to uh, put a number of methods in perspective in the way how um, uh, simulation societies and system dynamic societies and uh, are, are quite a number of other uh, teams and organizations um, uh, uh, view uh, this terminology. So at the uh, lowest end, uh, we have uh, traditional statistical models. Right? So with statistical models, we uh, have um, statistical equations, they could be linear or non-linear, say for example, you can think of regressions, and you can use regressions to make predictions. Uh, you can also add non-linear terms, you can also add time, so you can have time series. <coughs> but one of the things that statistical models cannot handle uh, uh, very easily is uh, movement between different states. So if you have individual or population um, that could be in different states. Right? So you can view it as uh, uh, a multinomial distribution. But uh, one of the important uh, component of, of, dynamical, uh, of, of, of dynamic model is that uh, individuals keep moving between different states. And uh, so uh, in order to account for transitions between these states, uh, uh, we, uh, we can use Markov um, uh, Markov models. And of course Markov models have their limitation because they don't uh, uh, account for, uh, for the history, but even if there is history, you can um, somehow adapt uh, Markov models that they could, you know, they, they will become bigger, but um, even somehow things of, 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 of including history in it. But one of the major <coughs> flaws of Markov models is that they cannot uh, account for feedback loops. And uh, uh, so, so in order to account for feedback loops, we, we really need to get uh, uh, more system dynamics models. Uh, but system dynamics, uh, uh, ah, should be systems dynamics. So uh, uh, systems dynamics models are um, um, uh, also very useful, but uh, but as well as statistical Markov and system dynamics, well, these uh, models are used at the population level. So they assume uh, heterogeneity. Uh, so if we really want to account for each individual, and, uh, and if you think of uh, an epidemic process, 
when uh, disease comes to town and uh, people start, start getting sick, the uh, contacts between individuals are very different. So we cannot assume that everybody is homo homogeneously mixed, like, you know, like, um, you know, juice in the glass. But uh, kids on the playground will have a much closer physical uh, contacts than, for example, adults in the workspace. Uh, so, so when you try to account for um, individual uh, heterogeneity, uh, 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 you really need to, to start using micro simulation models. And uh, uh, there is a class of models that is called discrete event models. And again, uh, I really want to uh, uh, know that uh, the terminology is not consistent. So, for example, in stochastic processes, uh, mathematicians would say, well, a discrete event is not a model. It's you know, just one, uh, uh, one component of stochastic process. You can think of discrete event, continuous event, discrete time, continuous time. But discrete event model for a discrete discrete event model in operations research and in um, um, you know a, a, a system science is, is is a special class of models. And then finally, uh, we have agent based models. And what becomes really uh, important about agent based models is the notion of uh, interaction between uh, uh, individuals. So discrete event uh, uh, simulations they. Uh, don't uh, don't consider interactions. So, uh, in this sense, running one individual many many times is uh, uh, often equivalent to uh, running this in, uh, uh, entire population. So, so the fact that uh, individuals not interacting um, is a limiting factor. So, uh, one of the examples I'm giving here is if you would like to. Uh, model uh, mail system. So you mail a letter, send it out, and the letter gets stamped, gets processed, gets delivered. Uh, but the, mail, the letter itself is passive. It doesn't look around and say, hey, okay, I'm laying out this package. I don't like this package. I just move somewhere else. So if you uh, have these interactions, you, uh, um, you'll need to uh, build an agent based model. So agent based models. Uh, essentially, can handle linear, nonlinear uh, 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 events, um, uh, phenomena, time, uh, states, feedback loop, heterogeneity, and uh, interaction. So, in this sense, it's uh, uh, the ultimate, the most comprehensive tool that um, uh, exists so far. Right, so, I uh, just wanted to uh, give a few, uh, few details about. Um, a few illustrations about uh, uh, each of these methods. So um, this is a um, classic uh, statistical model. So uh, you can have a regression, and you can use a regression to make a prediction. Uh, right. So if you change the uh, x variable, you can uh, estimate how uh, uh, how much change you will get in uh, your response variable. With uh, Markov models. Um, here is an example of um, um, a Markov model. So if we could uh, consider um, a global economy or a country's economy, and you can look at, um, you know, uh, on a weekly basis, whether uh, this week we'll, uh, we have bull market, bear market, or stagnant uh, market. Right? And so, Having lots of data about market uh, uh, about uh, uh, market behaviors, uh, what you can do is you can uh, uh, estimate uh, what will happen. If, for example, if this week was a bull market with probability 90%, the next week will also be a bull market, and um, uh, uh, and only with 10% um, uh, probability it will move to is a bear market or a, a stagnant market. So uh, the major property of Markov process is for the um, uh, transition matrix, which is essentially the matrix of, uh, of these probabilities. And uh, one of the features of, um, uh, of Markov models, uh, uh, of autonomous Markov models, is that uh, it could reach a, a steady state, meaning that um, if you randomly pick up a week, um, uh, out of you know the, uh, the past history and say okay what will be the probability that in that 
given week, we had a bear market, and that probability will be 57%. Uh, uh, All right, so uh, now I'll uh, give a quick example of a uh, system, uh, systems dynamics model. So uh, uh, systems dynamics has, uh, you know, the, the, uh, this is what we mean by feedback loops. Uh, so this, is, the, the, this uh, diagram, just uh, uh, only look at this black diagram, don't, don't, don't pay attention to blue one for, uh, uh, for a moment. Uh, so this diagram describes uh, a model of um, uh, drug use in schools. And it describes uh, events and describes uh, uh, forces that would either um, you know, push individuals towards uh, using drugs and push individuals away from using drugs. So you can see that there could be uh, uh, quite a number of responses Slide, I to put two things on the same slide, which doesn't work really well. So, so essentially, uh, if, if, if we have uh, lots of people uh, taking drugs in school, uh, then that will create uh, peer pressure to, uh, uh, to use drugs, and that will increase uh, 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 people taking drugs. And uh, when people are taking drugs, that will uh, increase strictness of uh, school rules. That, uh, uh, in turn, well, uh, or could lead to, to, to rebellion against strictness of the rules by people taking more drugs, so that will lead to uh, people taking more drugs. And then, uh, of course, when people try and use drugs, some of them become uh, dependent, um, and as soon as people become dependent, they will start using lots of money and uh, will, will get in debt. And, uh, uh, when they want to get out of debt, they, they, they can become uh, dealers. And um, uh, when you have lots of uh, drug dealers, then you know, uh, it, it is easy to, to, to buy drugs. And that, uh, in turn, increases people taking drugs. So, so, so this is what we, what we mean by feedback loops, is that there are a number of events and phenomena that uh, uh, feed into uh, each other. But, one of the most important uh, part of uh, feedback loops is, uh, uh, is probably this um, uh, diagram that um, uh, became a, a big uh, push, uh, at least uh, in the US, towards um, uh, system dynamics modeling. So what usually uh, happens if we have a problem um, you know, the government response and policy response is to fix this problem. And usually if there is a problem, uh, you know, you, and the problem becomes bigger, the bigger is the problem, the stronger is the push to fix it. And uh, one thing you can think about, like, the, the, the more you're trying to fix it, the less is the problem. So this is kind of like a natural, what's called like a, a balancing act that the government is trying to do. But what can happen is that with some fix, there will be a delay, and this is represented by, the, by a snowball going, that leads to unintended consequences that actually makes the problem worse. And so uh, this is very schematic representation of, 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 of feedback loops, but it, um, this became one of the um, uh, major focus um, uh, NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, Center for Disease Control, and other uh, um, institutions that uh, look at health and uh, consequences of policy. All right, so uh, system dynamics models, these, uh, uh, these types of models are usually modeled through vast uh, uh, dynamics. So um, each the, the, the um, uh, the population is divided into compartments and people moving between these compartments in the same way as water could move through the bathtub. So we can uh, consider a compartment uh, and then um, uh, people moving in and people moving out. Uh, but as I mentioned, that doesn't account for um, uh, 
uh, individual heterogeneity. So discrete event models uh, uh, have been used uh, quite a lot in queuing systems. Understanding uh, in other service systems. For example, this is a screenshot of a model for uh, an emergency department. And uh, what we have, we have individuals uh, who are coming in with, say, the boss home process with their various ailments. But when they get to um, uh, emergency department, uh, nurses uh, triage them and take them to different wards. And so this kind of model could be used for uh, optimizing uh, utilization of um, uh, uh, the emergency department. So, before we get to aging-based modeling, uh, I wanted to um, point your attention to different types of rules that uh, 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 we can think of. So, uh, I'll be talking now about global rules and local rules. And I think one of the illustrations is uh, a classic uh, orchestra. Actually, this is a, a, a Dublin uh, orchestra. And this is uh, a jazz band. So here we have global rules. We have a conductor. Uh, we have uh, scores. So everybody is uh, knowing what, they, what exactly they're going to play. And the quality um, of, of, of a classic orchestra is that when they say like uh, all violins are playing like one, right? So essentially, uh, uh, this is a representation of this concept that uh, we have in statistics of um, uh, uh, independent and uh, identically dis uh, uh, distributed observations. So maybe assumptions of independent could be dropped, but identically distributed, that's, that's a really key uh, uh, point here. So when you're thinking about jazz band, you're, you're thinking about musicians who are uh, who don't have any scores, they don't even know what they're playing, now. they're just uh, improvising. But what they do, they carefully listen to what other people are playing. And so a good jazz band could, uh, 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 could really create lots of interesting emerging patterns. And um, I think this is what uh, uh, characterizes the, uh, to me the difference between, um, say, system dynamics models and aging-based models. So I wanted uh, once again to um, uh, uh, to reemphasize that. So in system dynamics, we have global rules and global dynamics. So we don't care about any specific individual. We care about the whole population. In discrete event model, we still have global rules. So when the letter moves through uh, through the mail system, the rules are the same for all letters. But but you can track down an individual. With agent-based model, you have um, uh, it's a micro simulation that has um, uh, rules applied for for each individual person. So let me give you uh, an example of. Uh, well, probably uh, the first and uh, as the, uh, the most famous agent-based model. Okay, let me try again. All right. Okay. For some reason, I can uh, uh, only see the screen here, yeah. but uh, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So uh, this is a classic shelling segregation model. <coughs> what it means is that um, uh, in, in 1971, Schelling uh, had this hypothesis that in order to create a segregated community. You don't need to have um, uh, individuals being racist, and that uh, even a small um, uh, small percent so, uh, or, or, or a small desire to, to have more neighbors uh, to be similar to one um, 
will create to complete segregation. And so he created this model. So, so, so the way the model works, uh, we, have, uh, we have a space, so that will be a neighborhood. And uh, each dot represents um, a household. And so at each point of time, the household looks around, looks around their neighbors. And if they uh, see that uh, the number of neighbors of the same color uh, is bigger than the threshold, they stay. If it is less than the threshold, then they move to a, a, a random spot. And so let me show what, uh, uh, what it could do. So very, very quickly. Uh, okay. Oh, all right, so, so very quickly we can get uh, um, uh, uh, quite a complete segregation. And so uh, a few, few interesting results from this model is that even a small percentage, so if we can say you know, 39, so, so individuals demand that uh, at least, so, so, so if uh, at least one third of my neighbors are similar to me, I, I'm fine. I don't need to have the entire neighborhood to be to, 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 to look like me, but one third is okay. So uh, what what it will lead to? It will lead to quite a, quite a bit of separation. Another interesting uh, uh, result, uh, uh, unusual, was, and yeah. So you see, like we were demanding like 39 percent of uh, uh, of similar neighbors, but what we ended up with uh, is, is uh, uh, 80 uh, uh, 80 percent uh, uh, of, of, of neighbors become uh, uh, of the same type, and so another example will be if the demand is very high. So people say like, oh, okay, you know, I just try to be very racist and you know uh, want. Uh, like 90% or even, you know, 90% uh, of people around me to, to be the same. So what will happen is that uh, the system uh, will never convert. Uh, we will never reach an equilibrium, so it will become uh, uh, quite a mess. And so uh, these results were uh, quite unusual and unexpected. And so this is... Um, one of the values of uh, uh, an agent-based model that it could lead to some uh, very interesting um, results. So, um, actually, uh, let me show you another model. Oh, okay, excellent. All right. All right, so uh, this is a model of uh, wealth distribution. And when Pareto uh, discovered uh, the Pareto law of, of uh, well, uh, wealth distribution, it was not clear why, why does it happen, because essentially, uh, at that time, they were trying to tie up uh, wealth distribution to political system. And um, uh, one of the uh, things was, that, that one of the uh, claims that Mussolini was making is that, you know, if we have monarchy, then um, you, uh, you will have really, um, uh, you know, unfair distribution of wealth, and that's what Pareto discovered, that, you know, 20% uh, uh, of the population will uh, control 80% of wealth, and so if we just have a, 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 a different political system, we can break that and we can have a more even distribution of wealth. Uh, so in this model, uh, agents um, are, are, are acting according to uh, very simple rules. So we have a population of um, 250 uh, people uh, who live in the landscape of wealth. So uh, you, you can think of wealth as a, uh, um, as a pyramids of, of some resource, some food, for example. It could be like 
uh, grain or sugar or, or, or money, but not. And individuals uh, are moving around the space and they can <coughs> sense where, uh, where the wealth is. So they have um, a vision of uh, uh, five squares ahead so they can uh, identify uh, the gradient the gradient towards uh, uh, towards the peak of the wealth, right? So, and, and that's where they're moving. And, and this is a good analogy of, of a real world. So, you have an idea of um, what where wealth is, and, and that could be like whatever whatever you uh, consider about wealth. And so, you, uh, in your life, you're just trying to move towards towards your goal. And so, if we start with uh, equal uh, um, uh, 33, 33, 33 uh, uh, percent distribution of, um, of wealth, let's see what will happen when we uh, run this model. Yeah, and uh, uh, a couple of important conditions. So at each step, and so uh, individuals are moving towards their goal, towards their um, uh, 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 goal uh, uh, obtaining wealth, but if uh, if the uh, space is taken, then they cannot uh, move there. And at each step, they lose energy, they lose wealth, because in order to to, to have your activity, you have you know daily expenditures. But when they reach wealth, they uh, uh, can, uh, consume this wealth. Right. So this is what uh, uh, what will happen. Right, so everybody figured out uh, and, and sensed where uh, uh, where the wealth is, and so what we get is uh, it's really tricky to look one direction and move your hand in another direction. So okay. This is what uh, uh, this is what happens. So, uh, for majority of people, majority of people lost their wealth, and uh, you know the laws here are, are very simple. They are not connected to any political system or to any you know whether you have a dictatorship or monarchy or whatnot. You know they, these are very basic rules, and what we get is we will get a, a, a Pareto distribution. So that uh, people who are wealthy, there will be like about like a very small percent, and then uh, a middle class will be in the middle, and then uh, the, the majority of the population will be quite poor. And you can look at the uh, uh, Lorentz curve, which uh, which essentially uh, you know um, makes this kind of how, 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 which portion of the population will um, uh, will control uh, which percent of wealth. So these are the uh, uh, few examples that I wanted to show you as an agent based model. So these are, of course, uh, 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 theoretical, uh, uh, theoretical models. They're not, you know, the, the actual models that uh, are populated or calibrated by the uh, real world. Oh, uh, this, this is another. Uh, interesting model. It's an aging based model of uh, uh, El Farol Bar in uh, Santa Fe. Uh, it was inspired by um, uh, Yogi's, uh, Yogi Berra's statement about uh, one very popular club. He said, this club became so popular and so crowded that nobody goes there anymore. And so that <laughs> That became kind of paradoxical, and, 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 and they wanted to model uh, uh, El Farol Bar, which was a very popular bar uh, uh, in Santa Fe, and uh, uh, to see what will happen. And again, uh, we have individuals who uh, make uh, who look at the history of their visits to the bar and make a decision whether they should go to this bar or not. So, so uh, the bar uh, uh, is crowded. And they see the history of visits to the bar. It's not described. They, they will not go there. And so, as you see, the um, uh, popular the, um, the number of people in the bar is 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 is, is continuously fluctuating. 
Okay, so what are the um, main features of agent-based models? First of all, uh, agents are computer objects, as, uh, uh, as you saw. So these, uh, these computer objects could represent people, they could represent organizations, they could even represent teams or countries. Right, but uh, these agents are following a certain set of rules. So these agents can sense what is around them, they can make decisions based on what they see, they can uh, interact with other agents and they can do something to other agents. Like uh, uh, one of the uh, models that we discussed in the class is the model of uh, uh, wolves and sheep predation. So when uh, wolves uh, manage to capture sheep, they, they, they eat sheep. So, so in the same analogy with companies, um, you know, we have mergers and acquisitions. So. Uh, uh, the, the, they could be more than just interactions between agents. So agents could change uh, um, uh, their status. So it could be like a small company and uh, it, it, it lost its uh, uh, agency or identity and just became part of a large company. So uh, one could build models uh, based on uh, top-down or bottom-up. So agent-based models are usually build bottom-up. So you start with an individual and start <coughs> thinking about what this individual might want to do, what, what are their objectives, uh, what are the rules of behavior. And uh, so then uh, start putting together uh, groups of agents and this way build uh, virtual populations. And then, of course, uh, we can build hybrid models. We can combine um, agent-based models uh, with, say, system dynamics models. So environment could change uh, uh, much slower. And environment might be following global rules. So from this perspective, uh, environment could be modeled as uh, systems dynamics, and then agents uh, uh, living in this environment uh, could be modeled as uh, um, in terms of agent-based models. Uh, agents also could have uh, models and dynamics inside them. So for example, uh, this is uh, uh, an agent-based model for um, uh, drug use. So at the top you see what is called a state diagram. You can think of it as a Markov process, but, uh, mark of, uh, um, but the process defined at an individual level. So uh, unlike bathtub dynamics that we saw before, where we were thinking uh, in dividing population uh, into compartments and then following the flows of population, the flows of people between compartments. Here, for, for an individual, we have uh, states in which this person could be. And the person could be only in one state. It could not be in two states at the same time. So uh, individuals are born never using drugs, of course, right? But then as they grow up, they can get exposed to, uh, uh, to drugs. Then they could become recreational users. Then they could become addicted. They could go to treatment. They could quit. And uh, these cycles could, uh, uh, could repeat uh, in time. So these transitions uh, uh, could be modeled in uh, contact with, uh, uh, in connection with other agents. And so, uh, if you think again about drug use, uh, this transition or this transition cannot occur without having other drug users around. So, uh, say initiation, like, uh, I don't know if uh, anybody in their uh, clear mind uh, and uh, their own will will just say, oh, okay, why don't I try heroin? Right? So that's, that's not the usual uh, uh, pattern of behavior. It's somebody needs to bring you to, 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 to heroin you. So interaction, when we build this model, an interaction between individuals becomes critical. So these transitions um, now uh, 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 are influenced by in which states your friends or the social network uh, uh, members are. At the same time, inside an individual, we can also have a, a, a system uh, dynamics model. So 
inside an agent, also the agent could be like in each of these states, inside an agent you can have a, a model, and this is a pharmacological model uh, for alcohol. So if somebody drinks <coughs> alcohol, the uh, blood concentration goes up and then it goes down. Right? So um, we can model uh, physiological processes that could be drivers for uh, uh, people, for example, to, um, you know, um, to relapse. Right? So if the person is in treatment, but then just tries a, a, a little bit of, like an alcohol could be in treatment, and then just you know, tries a little bit of alcohol, and that would relapse this person to, uh, uh, um, uh, to become an alcoholic again. Right? So um, essentially, the message here is that we can make agents very complex. Well, we can also build social networks and we can uh, build social networks regardless of types of networks, but we can uh, the types of relationships. But we can also build uh, networks uh, that will account for uh, uh, specific relationships. Uh, and so the transition probabilities uh, uh, between different states will be influenced by uh, the types of, of, of relationships. So we can uh, eventually build a quite a complex model and we can uh, have an environmental factor that will influence uh, each of the agents. And speaking of environmental factors, we can have, uh, uh, we can represent agents on um, uh, geographic maps. So we can use GIS systems uh, um, to identify where the agents live, where they would go, where, uh, uh, what kind of behavior they would uh, 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 they would express. And so for that purpose we have developed a uh, synthetic population for the United States. So a synthetic population is essentially a virtual census. So at the block group level uh, the statistical characteristics of individuals are exactly matching the census. But inside that block group level, uh, we randomly assign individuals, like drawing from, from, from these distributions, uh, to uh, individual households. So what we uh, uh, say usually is just we, we populate Google Maps under the roof. So, so, so we place households under the roof. And when you add uh, different layers and uh, different demographic layers, different uh, socioeconomic layers, and um, other like, you know, health layers and whatnot, you can start identifying communities. So, for example, you can see, okay, this is the map of uh, uh, Dallas, so you can identify where uh, high income uh, communities are, where local income communities uh, are located. So, if you design an intervention, say, okay, we want to go to low-income communities and we want to, you know, uh, uh, advertise some policy of, you know, training, getting back to work, and, uh, uh, and whatnot. So this is where uh, you know where, uh, where to go and what will be the approximate boundaries of these communities. And as you can see, some, some boundaries are very sharp and, 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 and very natural, uh, uh, right? So, so there could be boundaries like lakes or rivers. But some of the boundaries are uh, quite vague, so we have communities uh, uh, intervening. Uh, uh, okay, <coughs> so um, I'll just uh, briefly mention an advantage of an agent-based model. So uh, with agent-based model, you can also track down uh, a specific individual, so you can follow possible trajectories that could happen to a specific individual. As opposed to system dynamics models where you're just tracking down populations and you're only looking at summary statistics. Here you're just looking at each individual step and uh, then of course you can produce the statistics. Uh, 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 anything? Okay, so if anybody is interested I can um, then uh, give examples of uh, more practical and uh, more real-world uh, agent-based models that, that have been calibrated uh, uh, with, with real-world data. But um, uh, given
given the time, I'll, I'll only mention you know, uh, uh, some uh, advantages and disadvantages of our uh, uh, matrix models. So uh, the major advantages is that, well, it allows you a lower level description. So when we are thinking about policies and interventions, policies are global. Policies are made by government that, that should be applicable to everybody. So the way these policies are implemented, how they are interpreted, they are um, done at the uh, individual level. Uh, we can also look at various levels of modeling. So we model individual behavior as well as um, individuals' physiology and uh, other uh, 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 medical um, uh, uh, medical health outcomes. Uh, another important mathematical feature of agent-based models over, say, a statistical marker or system dynamics model is that when we run a micro-simulation and if the, the process is inherently uh, uh, non-linear, then it's much, uh, the, the more accurate answers would be uh, uh, obtained if we follow uh, each individual and, and whatever happens to, to, to each individual and then average at the end to get global statistics. Rather than we average all individuals and work with the e-field um, uh, e models. And of course, uh, Asian baseballs uh, allow us to create virtual societies and uh, also uh, allow us to co uh, convert cohort studies uh, into population level models. So we can track a cohort and uh, estimate, like, we can look at the number of cohorts that were uh, studied uh, in, in terms of cardiovascular disease or cancer. And then we could recreate uh, an example of a population, and then uh, we can see what will happen to the population as the population uh, uh, ages. But then, of course, uh, aging-based models have quite a number of challenges, and because I really like aging-based models, I've uh, placed uh, uh, fewer challenges and fewer problems that will have advantages. Right? So um, the main problem, of course, is uh, data collection. So when you want to uh, model every individual, you really need to figure out where do you get all this information about how, how all these individuals act. Right? So you need to, uh, um, to get this data from somewhere. And they, that's why there have been lots of criticism of these models. But uh, at the same time, when we are talking about homogeneous mixing, when we are talking about Markov models or statistical models, the assumption of IIDs is extremely strong and we know that it's absolutely wrong assumption. Right? So if we make some assumption which, yeah, people ask you like, oh, okay, can you prove that your assumption is, is correct? Well, it's kind of like common sense. Uh, it might not be exactly correct, but it's definitely better than just assuming that everybody is continuously mixed and just throw everybody into ID-based uh, regression. Another, com uh, another issue is validation. As well, uh, especially statisticians who are used to uh, maximum likelihood or some, some measures of uncertainty, uh, I was saying like, well, we really need to um, attach some uncertainty measures and then validate your model to an independent data. Well, you can have an agent based model with 500 parameters and you can have only you know, 12 observations. As a friend of mine says, you know, my, my model has so many parameters I can uh, calibrate it to see more so yes. You know, so that's uh, uh, one of the challenges, of course, with 500 parameters, you can, you can fit any, any kind of data. <laughs> but nevertheless, so what people usually do is uh, validate individual components and then also uh, do pattern validation so that uh, uh, the model produces patterns that make sense and that we observe. So, so now uh, uh, it becomes an interesting area of statistics is just, you know, 
if you are presented with, 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 with two patterns, can you tell that, oh, yeah, the, these are similar patterns, or, or whether these this patterns are different? Okay, and then, of course, uh, there is an added uncertainty. And the very last slide, I think, is, oh, two slides. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, various sources uh, or uncertainty in agent-based models. So uh, uh, this source of uncertainty uh, we can easily deal with. We know what, uh, what it is. It's just uh, uncertainty in, um, in parameter estimation. So uh, we have lots of methodology here. But then we also base our models often on uh, borrowing uh, parameter values from published literature. And then, of course, educated guess what we don't have. No clue how much should be the parameter how things can be done. So we do that. Of course, um, uh, inside agent-based models, we have stochasticity that adds to, 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 to variability of results. There is structural uncertainty. So if you take two modelers and ask them to build the same model, they will build them in different ways. Uh, deep uncertainty. This is something that you know when we're making predictions say five, ten years uh, 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 away from now, there are things that we cannot even foresee that could happen five years from now, right? And then, of course, uh, analysis of the output. So when we simulate uh, a large number of outcomes, we need to do the analysis. And, uh, and, and this is a uh, you know, traditional uncertainty when we do with analysis. So if you have a count Data you can use it as continuous, you can use it as a Poisson, you know you will get slightly different results, and then of course the interpretation, you know, is whether the glass of this half full or half empty, right? And the very last thing that I wanted to um, uh, show is that. Uh, you might think that agent-based models could become very complex, and they truly can. And in order to somehow um, um, standardize description uh, of agent-based models, so if I develop a model, uh, I could write a description to such an extent that I, give, that I can give it to somebody else and they could reproduce it. Uh, they came out, uh, uh, Rails back and Grimm, Came back with came up with uh, what's called uh, ODD standard overview design concept and detail, and so this is essentially a checklist. The checklist of of things that one has to uh, present, you know, uh, has to at least comment on uh, in pres in presentation and also in development of an agent based model. So so if you have an agent based model, you will need to to answer to each of these items about your uh, uh, agents and about their component. And of course, purpose is the most important um, uh, answer. So I will present. Okay, that's, that's the slide I was going to Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one or two questions at the very most. Any questions from the audience? Andres? Yeah, I have one, but I don't, don't want to make it too long. I have, I have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which has to do uh, with the circularity or potential circularity of some of that. So, if it's true in systems theory, the most important thing is to make a distinction at the beginning, right? And it depends, everything that will depend on that distinction because it defines the system and its environment. So, once you've made that distinction and it is a delicate one that you actually want to look into. The danger of being circular and remaining circular in your, market, in your argument are very, very high. I'll give you one example. We have a, currently L12, an encyclopedia that comes out in multi volume of the Elsevier. So it was a biography editor. I have 280 biographies, biographies of social scientists that made the grade. Yeah? They came in. Now, I'm already circular here because they are in the encyclopedia because some people decide that these guys are important. Now I want to look at how do they become icons in the social sciences, right? I can use all these models, put them to good use, and still come out with very, very, very little in the end. 
I mean, it's a kind of circular argument. They are important because they are important because they are important. I, I cannot get over that loop. What kind of additional information could I get if I don't make get my first, my first round of definition of what I want? How can I play around with this? You know, I'm, I, I'm insecure about the outcome. Um, what would you advise me to do? Okay, all right. You know, as I usually say, whenever in doubt, look at the purpose. Okay. So, what what do you want to show and why? How these guys became icons. Okay. But partly that they, this part is circular because they are in the encyclopedia right, right. because they are right. famous, right. right? Right. Okay. All right. So then, uh, I think the the good thing to detangle that is to look at the time and say, uh, look at, you know, just uh, go back in time from the point when they were not famous and at which point each person became famous. So, is it because somebody made them famous or is it because, uh, you know, somebody published a lot and then at some point, you know, so, so, so there are so many pathways to, uh, uh, to become famous, right? So, uh, and so just looking at this pathway, and then, then you might ask yourself which pathways you think are truly uh, valuable. So if somebody starts, you know, as a, 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 as a postdoc and just works their way, you know, just publishes, you know, a few papers and then, you know, builds it up and then makes a great, uh, um, a great discovery or a great impact on the society uh, and not, not necessarily becomes famous at that point maybe maybe become famous later for for that thing that they do or you know they became famous and then everything that they publish now becomes uh, um, you know highly cited it's what, what, what we say you, you know the first half of your life you work for your name the second half of your name your, na your name works for you and something like this so, so, so you can Oh, yeah, time. So secret thing, basically. Yeah, yeah. Like well, we, we had this discussion uh, uh, actually earlier today, in, uh, in resolving things like that, it was uh, the movie, the American movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So there are like three cowboys essentially who hate each other, and then finally they meet each other, and three of them are standing, and both has two guns. And so we have three people, you know, each point, and so at some point they will shoot. So the, the, the level of uncertainty is incredible because, you know, who shoots first? And you don't want to shoot first. Because if you shoot first, you kill that guy, but then this guy will kill you, right? So, <laughs> so it's the, 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 the one who shoots last wins in this situation. But, but again, this is an, an interesting like, just a circle of logic. The way it's modeled in uh, agent-based modeling is, again, in the same way. So we detangle time, we just add a little bit of perturbation. So when, when the person shoots, you know, we just randomly flip, flip up the coin who, who will shoot in which, uh, in which gun. So here, you know, when you think of, you know, when, when the person becomes famous, does this fame grow up you know, slowly or the person woke up famous? And then what really, like what, what was that time increment? I, I don't know, I'm just making things up. I know, some ideas, yeah. And I suggest that we stop. Actually, no? Thank you again, Murky, right. for that fantastic presentation. I think it's thrown out of time.